Hey, good day, everybody. This is Dr. Mandis here with a little bit of a talk about IMF. We talked about IMFs in a previous uh, posting. Right now, I just want to apply IMFs. How do I identify IMF? What's the practical aspect of IMFs? We know what they are. They're the things that hold the particles together. Not the individual particles inside a molecule, but that hold molecules together, that hold ions together in a salt, that hold metal atoms together in a sheet of metal. Those are IMFs. Already, they, the way you identify an IMF principally is through the bond type. We talked about that earlier in another posting. Right now, I want to practice identifying IMF, uh, applying that to a solubility, and applying that to a phase change. So let's get right at it. And number one, we're going to talk about the predominant IMF and five different compounds. And you have to look at them and say, what do I have in that compound? In letter A, we have carbons and hydrogens. Carbons and hydrogens have similar electronegativity. They're non-metals. Since they're non-metals, you're thinking they're covalent. Since they have similar electronegativities. They're not the sexy, you know, corner, the sexy five of the corner, CL, NOF, CLBR. You got one of those guys in you, you got some polarity. Don't have that. So what do we have? We have a non-polar covalent compound. That means the only thing we got is London dispersion. And it's going to be a really weak interaction, but it's the only interaction they got. Everybody does have London dispersion, but in propane, letter A, the only thing you're going to get is London dispersion. Letter B, you got nitrogen. I thought I just said, hey, man, if you got nitrogen in there, one of the sexy little corner guys, shh, high electronegativity. We do, but we got two nitrogens. So it's like two really strong guys pulling on the pair of electrons. Their, their net effect is going to cancel each other out. So in this case, the only thing we're going to have there is a nonpolar covalent bond, which gives us another London dispersion. Letter C, magnesium and chloride. We got a non-metal in there in the chloride, but we got a metal there in the magnesium. You should reckon that as ionic. Moving on, ionic is just that positive and negative interaction that's holding the whole thing together. Moving onwards there, we got letter D. You see a bunch of non-metals there. You have H's, N, and C. You see that wicked little N there, so you say, hey, man, I got my N. I didn't mean to put N's everywhere, but hey, it's an N. If we have an N, we're going to have clarity. Okay, so we're thinking either dipole dipole or hydrogen bonding. There are hydrogens in there, not these hydrogens, they're not attached to the ends. Those hydrogens are on the end. end. Those H's are on the ends. So we have an end, we got hydrogen bondling, that lower end with an H attached, we got hydrogen bonding. Of the covalent IMFs, London dispersion, dipole dipole hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding is the strongest. That's nothing on ionic. Ionic is a lot stronger than hydrogen bonding. Lastly, letter E there. Copper is a metal atom. He's a metal atom all by himself, not hooking up with the non-metal, so you know it's not ionic. It's just a metal atom. That should be something easy to identify. Metal atoms are metallic IMFs. You say, well, I thought IMF was intermolecular. How's a metal atom intermolecular? It's just a name. Get over it. I've seen some teachers call them interparticle forces, but realistically, just Call it IMF. We're good to go. All right. Anyway, moving on to number two. I got two isomers here. I have the ethanol and the dimethyl ether. One's an alcohol, one's an ether. One is really soluble in water, one is not. Okay. To dissolve into something, you have to have some attractive pull to get into that something. But what is the something we're talking about? We're talking about water, H O H. Two little shink. Da, da, da. Water is hydrogen bonding. It is polar covalent with the HO bond. It has a dipole that runs to the oxygen. It has an H bonded to an O, so we have hydrogen bonding. Remember earlier with the H bonded to the N for hydrogen bonding. Remember it's F O or N. So we have hydrogen bonding as our IMF. Well, we need some attractive IMF to one of our two species, either the alcohol or the ether that can allow it to be pulled into the water. The water's got to surround it, pull it all in. So the water has to attract into it. Well, if you look at the alcohol, this guy has an O on the H, so he's going to be hydrogen bonding. All right. The dimethyl ether has an O in there, but there's no H on the O. Some people get confused the way it's written. It's really, you can think of it this way, H, C, H. O, CH3. 
either way, this way where you spread out the H's or that way where you don't is kind of acceptable. So you can see that there is no H bonded to the O. There's no H on the O, so it's just polar covalent. That means the dimethyl di ether here is dipole-dipole, which I'm going to abbreviate as dip-dip. All right. Two similar IMFs can attract each other. The hydrogen bonding of the water can attract the hydrogen bonding of the alcohol. Look at it this way. The H of the O to the O to those two carbons, they can line up and we can have a hydrogen bond here and a hydrogen bond there. So that can pull it in. Similar IMFs dissolve. This similar IMFs even less so. The dipole-dipole of the dimethyl ether is going to pull it in a little bit, but not so much. A little bit, which is why it's called sparingly soluble. So it's the alcohol that's really soluble, and the dimethyl ether is not. What you want to say is for the alcohol, similar IMFs so that it can dissolve. I'm not going to write that because you don't want to watch me write that. For the dimethyl ether, you would say that it has doesn't have the same IMF. Uh, is the hydrogen bonding of the water, so therefore it cannot create the positive interaction, not positive is in charge, positive is in good, uh, an attraction force that pulls it in. Remember, IMS are intermolecular forces of attraction. Okay, so you need an attraction to be soluble. IMS also affect phase change. And we're going to do one quick question on that. Don't want to paddle on too long about this, but we're going to talk about phase changes, but we need to have a quick review of phases. Solids vibrate. Liquids also vibrate, but they rotate. Gases do everything. Gases vibrate, rotate, and translate. Translate means they, means they move from point A to point B. What you want to picture, what I have to tell kids a picture, is picture balls in a ball pit. You know, like at a McDonald's or Burger King, you look a ball pit or a uh, boardwalk. If you glue all those balls together, they're all stuck together. That's a solid. The IMF glues them together. So if you toss a kid in that ball pit, he's just going to skate right off the top and be really pissed at you. All right. To melt the solid, if you have all those little balls in there, the ball pit, are all together. All those little balls of the ball pit, you have to melt the glue that's gluing them together. Remember, we glued our ball and the balls together. That melt Okay, loosens the IMF enough so that the balls can roll on each other. Another analogy you could use is like a nut on a bolt, something that's stuck. If you just loosen it so it can, the nut can roll on the bolt, that's like a melting. It's not separated, but it can roll around. All right, that's a liquid. Liquids rotate. They roll around on each other. Gases, on the other hand, gases translate from point A to point B. The boiling, you have to undo the IMF and then the particles fly free. For the ball pit analogy, you would actually have to get in there, take the ball out of the pit, and chuck it out of the pit. That's a gas, okay? They're flying around, not touching each other anymore, okay? Because they're flying around, uh, boiling is a total breakage, all right? So the heat to actually break it is going to be more heat than just to loosen it. So that's why the heat of vaporization is typically more than a heat of fusion. Later on, we study thermodynamics. We can actually get into that in greater detail, but it should make sense. To loosen a nut, eh, to loosen something is one thing, but to totally separate them and pull them completely apart, that's something else altogether. So here we go. My last little example problem. You got propylamine here, okay, versus the ethyl diamine, all right? Right away, you should... Right away, you should realize that I'm messing up on myself. Right away, you should realize that hey, H2N, H bonded to an N, H2N, H2N. So we have sites of hydrogen bonding. Okay, so this is hydrogen bonding. This is hydrogen bonding. So we have really similar IMFs. All right. Oh my goodness. Well, one can hydrogen bond more than the other one. How do I know that? Because it has two, two sites of hydrogen bonding. So if we could sketch out really fast one of these could hook up with another one. Should already written these out. I hate watching myself right. If they hook up, they can hydrogen bond through here. London dispersion through here. London dispersion is really weak, but these little dashes usually represent a hydrogen bond. If you look at the other, the diamine, it has two sites of hydrogen bonding. Uh, 
while the Gennheim bond through both ends, London dispersion through the nonpolar center. Okay, but if we can hydrogen bond at one end and the other, want that time together just a little bit more. So if you want to boil it, you need to break twice as many connections that are strong. So since you have to boil it, all right, that you have to break twice as many, then the boiling, it's going to take more energy. So what you want to say, if you're answering questions like this, is you want to talk about how there's more energy. You have a stronger IMF. All right, two hydrogen bonds are definitely stronger than one hydrogen bond. Stronger IMF, so that requires more energy to overcome. I like using the word overcome rather than break. You can say to break the IMF. I like to overcome an IMF. And the only reason I say that is because some students will write to break and they immediately break bonds because somehow that alliteration, break bonds. IMFs are not bonds. I know it's hydrogen bonding, it's a misnomer. but Say you overcome an IMF and you get away from the whole idea that you're destroying the molecule because the molecules are still intact. They're just no longer touching each other. Just like the balls in the ball pit were still intact when you got in there and you chucked one across the street. Okay, you didn't break the balls. You broke the connection between them. All right, so a stronger IMF requires more energy. Sorry, didn't write the more to overcome the IMF. So a higher temperature is needed. to supply that energy, and that is seen in the higher boiling point. Anyway, I hope you love this. Again, I hope you learned something. I'll prattle on a little bit at the end. I apologize for that. You have yourself a great day.